This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning. Um, the first slide is my disclosures. So um, this morning I'm going to talk about medical management of peripheral artery disease, both to reduce rates of cardiovascular events and also to improve walking performance. So with regard to reducing cardiovascular events, secondary prevention should focus on statins, smoking cessation, antiplatelet therapy, and blood pressure control. And for walking performance, exercise and medications are what I will be discussing. So first, um, reducing cardiovascular risk, it is well established that statin medications reduce rates of heart attack and stroke in patients with PAD by about 25%, significant reduction. Um, current recommendations are not to get so focused on the LDL, but simply to prescribe the most highest dose of the most potent statin. And the highest potency statins are listed here. And these are generally safe and well-tolerated medications. As we all know, uh, cigarette smoking is one of the most powerful predictors of peripheral artery disease. So every patient with PAD who smokes should be advised to quit. And um, a plan, a therapeutic plan, should include pharmacotherapy, particularly with varenicline, which has the highest success in smoking cessation, but also bupropion and nicotine <coughs> replacement therapy. In addition to pharmacotherapy, all patients should be referred to a smoking cessation program. Uh, Antiplatelet therapy also reduces cardiovascular events, and the current clinical practice guidelines recommend either aspirin or clopidogrel. If you look at all the evidence, um, I think clopidogrel probably works best, um, although that's not been definitively established in PAD. Evidence does not support combining aspirin and clopidogrel to prevent cardiovascular events. And the role of verapaxor um, is still unclear, um, as listed in the recent clinical practice guidelines. Now, a note about verapaxor, which is a novel and a relatively new antiplatelet agent. It is an antagonist of protease-activated receptor 1. Um, there are PAR1 receptors on not only platelets, but also on vascular endothelium and smooth muscle. And of interest is the fact that randomized clinical trial data show that vorapaxor does not reduce rates of cardiovascular events in people with PAD when added to antiplatelet therapy, but it does reduce lower extremity events, in, including the incidence of acute limb ischemia and including lower extremity revascularization rates. Anticoagulation with warfarin is not indicated um, based on the WAVE trial. Um, but is associated, it's not indicated to reduce cardiovascular events um, when added to antiplatelet therapy, and it is associated with increased risk of bleeding. Um, Antihypertensive therapy should be administered. Almost all patients with peripheral artery disease have hypertension, and their blood pressure should be controlled. And it appears that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are, may be particularly effective to reduce cardiovascular event rates in patients with PAD. So I would keep that in mind when selecting an antihypertensive agent. With regard to medical management to improve walking ability in peripheral artery disease, we still have just two FDA-approved drugs to improve walking performance in PAD, and no new FDA-approved drugs since 1999. Solostazole is a phosphodiesterase type 3 inhibitor with vasodilator antiplatelet properties, and it provides modest benefit um, in treadmill walking performance for PAD patients, about 40% improvement in treadmill walking, which is much less than one can get with supervised exercise. And side effects are pretty common, and they include headache, palpitations, diarrhea, and lightheadedness. And in one study, as many as 20% of patients with PAD prescribed solostazole stopped it because of the side effects. Pentoxifylline in the most recent American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology clinical practice guidelines is not recommended because most recent data show that it's no better than placebo. 
Now, supervised treadmill exercise is well established to be a highly effective medical therapy for patients with peripheral artery disease. As of five years ago, we had 25 randomized clinical trials of over 1,000 patients studied for anywhere from four weeks to two years, and the data consistently show significant improvement in treadmill walking performance. For PAD patients receiving supervised treadmill walking, this is about 180 meter improvement in this meta-analysis on the treadmill in patients who received supervised treadmill exercise. Also, based on available evidence, it appears that a supervised exercise program that includes walking exercise at least three times a week for at least 30 minutes per session and perhaps walking to maximal claudication pain is most beneficial, although the jury is still out on that, and a program of about six months is most effective. However, one starts to see improvement after about 12 weeks of therapy. Now, this may be the most important slide that I show you today. Um, you're probably aware that, the, that CMS has a memorandum out saying that evidence is now sufficient um, for them to provide coverage for supervised exercise for patients with intermittent claudication and peripheral artery disease. So this is something that uh, many people have been working hard to achieve for years and finally appears uh, to come to fruition likely by the end of this calendar year. Here's what CMS would cover. It requires, the, the coverage by CMS would require a physician's prescription uh, for, and it will cover 12 weeks of supervised exercise three times a week. Um, they do say that after the 12 weeks, you can request, um, and it, you need to justify it, but you could request an additional 36 sessions. And the exercise has to take place either at a hospital or in an outpatient hospital setting, and it must be delivered by qualified personnel um, with basic and advanced cardiac life support training, and there must, it must take place under the direct supervision of a physician. Now, that doesn't mean the physician has to be standing there, but needs to be in the vicinity um, of the facility. So um, I imagine that many people in the room, uh, many hospital centers will be getting these programs up and running because now um, patients will have much greater access to them. So what do you need to get something like this started? Um, we, in our exercise studies, like to have treadmills that start at 0.5 miles an hour because some of the patients can only walk at this speed when they first start out. Um, a qualified personnel is, could certainly be an exercise physiologist or an RN, and um, this, they may take place in cardiac rehab programs, but of course they don't have to. It just has to take place at a hospital setting. And I would recommend that a cardiac stress test be ordered before somebody, um, a PAD patient, that is, starts a new exercise program because of the high prevalence of coronary artery disease. Um, we tend to start people at 15 er, minutes of walking per session. That does not include rest. Um, and they should increase their walking time by about five minutes each week. And we work up to about 45 to 60 minutes of walking time on the treadmill. And it doesn't happen immediately, as you know, but by week four, you start to see improvement. And you achieve near maximal improvement by about 12 weeks. So um, in summary, supervised treadmill exercise is extremely effective for improving walking performance in patients with PAD. And um, I will say that even with, with CMS coverage, that for many patients with PAD, um, this, the requirements of supervised exercise, that is attending the sessions three times a week, can be onerous. Um, and I can tell you from our experience recruiting patients for our exercise trials, it's much easier to enroll for a home-based exercise program than it is for supervised where we ask them to come three days a week. So that leads us into home-based exercise for PAD patients. And current clinical practice guidelines give home-based exercise a class 2A, meaning that it's very reasonable to prescribe home-based exercise for PAD, and the level of evidence is A, because there are now randomized trials showing that this works. Um, so even with the advent of CMS coverage, I think that home-based exercise is still going to be important for patients with PAD. 
And I want to um, show you briefly what I think is probably a very informative, perhaps the most informative, randomized trial of home-based exercise for PAD patients. And this was conducted by Andy Gardner. It was 180 patients who were randomized to one of three groups, supervised treadmill exercise, home-based exercise, or a control group. And in the home-based exercise, they got a Fitbit or an activity monitor that tracked their activity and they returned to the medical center once a month to go over, get feedback on how they were doing and to have goals set for the next four weeks. And after 12 weeks, this, these are the findings for treadmill walking performance shown on the y-axis. The group that was randomized to supervise exercise had significant improvement in treadmill walking performance but so did the home-based exercise group, um, and then the control group improved only a little bit. Both the supervised and the home-based groups improved their treadmill walking more than the control group. Now, here's the results for the six-minute walk. Um, and here you see that not only did the home-based program do better than the control group, they also did better than the supervised exercise group. And um, this is something that we see consistently in our trials, that if patient is walking for exercise at home, on the street, over ground, they tend to do better on the six-minute walk, which is a corridor walk. Whereas if they're training on a treadmill, then they do better preferentially on the treadmill compared to the six-minute walk. And because walking in daily life is most similar to a six-minute walk, perhaps home-based exercise is particularly beneficial and relevant to daily walking activity. So we now have several trials, three trials, showing that home-based exercise can be effective. The successful programs do incorporate behavioral change intervention. What I mean by that is if you simply tell a PAD patient, go home and walk, and don't follow up with them, don't give them an activity monitor, those trials have not been so successful. So having a coach that calls them, checks in on them, um, this does not have to be a nurse, um, but just someone they're accountable to having an activity monitor seemed to make a difference. So um, let's say you, you have a patient who has finished 12 weeks of CMS covered supervised exercise, but now the coverage is over. Um, Home-based exercise could be a very effective strategy for them. Now, in contrast to supervised exercise, we tend to tell people to walk four to five days a week because it becomes a habit. It becomes part of their daily life. And we have them start with 10 or 15 minutes of walking exercise. You have to tell them it's okay to stop and rest, um, but they try to get in initially 10 to 15 minutes of walking and work up five minutes a week until they're getting up to 45 or 50 minutes. And an activity monitor, I can tell you that PAD patients love them and really, they really do seem to motivate them. Um, so uh, even with the home-based program, it's not easy to prescribe because some follow-up is required, as I mentioned, with a coach or an activity monitor for it to be effective. Um, the benefits may be more durable, however, than supervised exercise based on some data that are available. So to summarize exercise in PAD, walking exercise is effective. Both supervised and now more recently home-based can be effective. CMS coverage is coming um, later this year, probably by the end of the year. And if you do decide to use the home-based method, remember, you really require some behavioral intervention as well. So let me talk about a couple of other exercise modalities that have also been studied in PAD. One is strength training in PAD, and um, there was an early small trial that showed significant improvement in treadmill walking and with strength training in PAD, but the evidence suggests that this is not as effective as walking exercise. Um, Here is the largest trial of strength training, which we actually did in Chicago, where patients with PAD were randomized to supervised treadmill exercise, strength training, oops, or a control group. And you can see the supervised treadmill group had the greatest improvement in the six-minute walk. The strength trained did not, was not significantly different than the control group. However, we did see significant improvement in the strength trained group on treadmill walking performance. Um, so that was interesting, and I don't know if that was because we did five minutes of treadmill walking before we did the strength training, but, you know, there's probably a small benefit of strength training, but if you have to choose, I would, I would always go with walking exercise first. 
Um, another exercise intervention that has been effective is upper and lower extremity ergonometry. And it's often PAD patients ask, well, could I do bike riding? Because I like to you know, ride a stationary bike. And there is evidence that that can be effective. Um, here's one of the randomized trials in which PAD patients were randomized to either upper limb, where they were exercising their arms, lower limb, which is like cycling, ergometry or a control group, um, and patients were followed for six months. And the top two um, lines here are showing the leg training, the cycling groups. You can see they have significant improvement in treadmill walking distance. And down here, um, this is the upper ergometry training, also significant improvement compared to a control group. So both of these modes, and this is not the only trial, there have been several to show similar benefits. Um, so these are both effective strategies, um, and the mechanism of benefit may be related to improved cardiovascular fitness. Um, so let's talk about some novel medical therapies for aquatication. Um, one is angiotensin receptor blockers. I'll talk briefly about GMCSF and what the evidence has shown. And then um, epicatechin-rich cocoa, there's some, a small pilot trial suggesting that epicatechin-rich cocoa can acutely improve treadmill walking performance, and metformin may, may be of interest too. We're actually, we have trials underway testing both of these interventions. Um, so telmasartan is interesting. It's an angiotensor receptor blocker, but it's a little unique in its class in that it seems to have greater benefit on um, improving uh, perfusion of tissues, and it also has a benefit on skeletal muscle, um, improving mitochondrial activity and improving um, muscle uh, regeneration as well. And in, in an intriguing small pilot trial of 36 patients with PAD and claudication who were randomized to telmosartan or a placebo and followed for 12 months, there was significant improvement in treadmill walking performance in those who received the telmosartan compared to those who received the placebo. And this trial also demonstrated significant improvements in, in endothelial function and blood flow as well. Um, and this is another intervention that we're testing in a larger group of people to see if, it, if these findings hold, hold up. And then granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor for PAD. This is an intervention that increases progenitor cells from the bone marrow and the spleen with the idea that they home to, that can increase progenitor cells that can set up new blood vessels and promote capillary growth in ischemic tissue also improves endothelial function. So in a study that was published several years ago in JAMA, this is the largest trial of GMCSF in people with PAD, um, the patients were randomized to GMCSF, delivered subcutaneously three times a week for four weeks. Um, they actually self-administered it, or a placebo, and outcomes were measured at three and six month follow-up. The primary outcome measure was treadmill walking performance, and this was a negative trial. Um, their primary outcome time point was at three-month follow-up, and you can see that the GMCSF was no different. This is baseline here. This is three-month follow-up and six-month follow-up. The GMCSF group is shown in red, but there was no significant difference um, in GMCSF compared to placebo in treadmill walking performance. It did, however, improve the walking impairment questionnaire, which is a PAD-specific questionnaire focusing on patient-perceived walking performance, and it did improve quality of life at three-month follow-up, but these were not primary outcomes, and overall, it was a negative study. And then just in the last year, another stem cell focused um, trial from the NHLBI consortium, they actually harvested ALDH, ALDH right cells from the bone marrow and injected them into thigh and calf muscle of patients with PAD um, and then followed them for treadmill walking performance. Again, these are progenitor cells that ideally would perform new blood vessels and improve perfusion of calf muscle, um, but this was a negative trial as well. And this it may be hard to read, but the bottom line is that peak walking time on the treadmill was not better in the patients that received these reinjected. AD, ALDH bright cells, and neither was collateral growth overall improved. In a post hoc analysis, they looked at people who had occluded 
uh, femoral arteries and found a significant improvement in collateral growth in those receiving the ALDH bright cells, but that was post hoc, and I think overall this is a pretty, this is a negative trial. So um, the stem cell therapies for patients with PAD and claudication overall have been disappointing and not shown benefit. We are actually completing a trial um, looking at GMCSF combined with exercise, um, so we can see what that trial shows as well. So um, this is my last slide, and to conclude, medications have definitely improved cardiovascular event rates in patients with PAD. Um, you know, it used to be that about 75% of deaths in PAD patients were cardiovascular disease, and now um, in our PAD studies, that the most common cause of death is actually cancer, um, and cardiovascular disease deaths are still common, but not the majority. Um, and medical therapies are needed for patients with PAD. By far the most effective medical therapy is exercise, and with the advent of CMS coverage for supervised treadmill exercise, uh, I think this provides a real opportunity to uh, get our PAD patients really engaged in supervised treadmill exercise. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, one question, um, as we're waiting for some questions from the audience, uh, you uh, work a fair amount on depression and mental health and uh, patients with PED, and do you see um, um, those patients with, uh, for example, depression not engaging as much in the uh, supervised exercise or home-based exercise, and how do you deal with it, or what are your, um, um, solutions to that? Yes, so um, as you know and have shown, depression is particularly common in patients with peripheral artery disease. Um, and we've, I have to tell you, we've not, we've not systematically looked at whether patients with depression are less likely to engage um, in walking exercise. Um, we did in our SILK trial, which was the strength training trial results that I showed, we did not see improvement in depression depression symptoms in the exercise groups, um, which was disappointing, but one would imagine that it would be more difficult for depressed people to engage in exercise. We just haven't, we haven't specifically okay. asked that question. Great. Dr. Eichler? So, with the home exercise, the supervised exercise and such, if you have a patient that comes in to see you, what do you tell them? Go home or go get supervised? Because I guess if you don't, Yeah, I mean, I do, I do still recommend supervised exercise first, and mainly for that reason, and particularly with CMS coverage coming. And as you all know, it's, you know, it's hard enough to get a healthy person who doesn't exercise to start exercising, but <coughs> PAD patients who have all this pain when they walk, it's really hard. And I do think that having a coach right there that can encourage them is, is huge. However, um, a lot of PAD patients won't do it, and partly because it's hard, but partly because traveling to the exercise center three times a week is burdensome. Um, and so I think in that patient who's not willing or not able to go three times a week, then the home-based exercise is worth trying. And some of them will do it even without a coach. I mean, I don't... I, I follow up when they come back for follow-up, but I don't have a coach in my practice that calls them. Some of them will take it up. Getting them to stick to it, it's more difficult. So just to dovetail on that a little bit, I mean, we're in the era of wearable tech. Everybody has a cell phone in their pocket. Has anybody developed an app to monitor, administer, motivate the patients for home exercise programs specific for claudication? Well, um, not to my knowledge. Um, I, it may be being worked on, but I will tell you that you know we're doing a couple home-based exercise programs now, and we thought about using a smartphone. But the time we started the study four years ago, most of our PAD patients in Chicago did not have smartphones. That's changed in the last yeah. four years, and it's going to continue to change. We have used iPads, though. In fact, in one of our trials, we actually gave 
they either had their own computer, or we gave them an iPad, and they, you know, good, most of them will take that up and they can track their progress, and I do think those things help. Yeah, I think so too. This one, that was a great talk. I have, so the, you said you referred patients for supervised exercise, so how did you do that? Those patients all paid for it themselves? Well, most people don't take it up, but I have had a couple patients who are able to pay um, occasionally, even now, a medical insurance company will pay. Most don't. But um, I've had a couple of patients willing to pay out of pocket, and I referred them to our cardiac rehab program. And it's very telling that I got a call from the nurse at cardiac rehab the first time someone actually went and said, what do you want us to do with this person exactly? Um, but, you know, it turns out they did have a protocol, and, and you can give them the instructions here. But right now, they mainly have to be willing to pay. Quick question. If you set them up for home-based ex exercise, actually, is there, do you think eventually there's going to be coverage for that also, at least for an initial visit, or that gets... Um, um, I think possibly, because, um, I, you know, of course, things are changing in healthcare now, but, um, you know, there has been increasing interest on the part of insurance companies of you know, telemonitoring or monitoring people at home, obviously with diabetes or heart failure, and to monitor weights and prevent bad outcomes. So I think there could be, I think there should be, and um, I think it's possible. Thank you very Thank you. much Thank for you. a wonderful talk.